In the last portion of today's lecture, we're going to talk about some practical details that are needed to make policy gradients actually work. So the policy gradient approach that we've discussed so far is mathematically pretty simple and quite elegant. Unfortunately, if you try to implement it exactly the way I described it, it probably won't work. So the, there are a number of additional details that are you know, seemingly more minor, but they turn out to be really critical for policy gradients to work in practice. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to improve the policy gradient estimator a little bit. The trouble with the estimator we discussed so far is that it doesn't utilize any knowledge about the temporal structure of the problem. Notice that we're taking the sum of the gradients of the log probabilities of all the actions and multiplying it by the sum of all of the rewards. This doesn't actually account for the fact that future actions can't influence past rewards. Essentially, this formula for the gradient would be true for any uh, factorization of the distribution uh, over the actions and states. It's just a general gradient estimator for probability distribution. It's not actually specific to sequential decision making. We can, however, build a better estimator that is a little bit more specific to sequential decision making by taking note of the fact that future actions can't influence past rewards. The intuition behind what we're going to do is we're going to avoid multiplying actions in the future, actions at a future time step, by rewards at a past time step. The reason why this is correct uh, is a little bit more involved. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to describe the method uh, and uh, you know I'll, I'll give you a reference at the end of this part for a paper that explains why this is correct. Uh, but I won't actually prove that it's correct here. So you can think of this approach as basically exploiting causality. Uh, not causality in the sense of finding causal explanations, but more like the, 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 the much more obvious notion of causality, which is that the past causes the future, but the future cannot cause the past. So basically, the arrow of time points in a single direction. The policy at time t prime cannot affect the reward of time t when t is less than t prime. This is just a fact about how our universe works. This is always true. So if we um, rewrite the standard policy gradient, so we haven't changed anything yet, we're just rewriting in a different way, by distributing the sum over rewards inside the sum over uh, grad log pi's, we get the equation that you can see here. So we haven't changed anything, we just use the distributive property to put the sum of rewards inside that sum over grad log pi's. So we have an outer sum from t equals one to capital T of grad log pi, and every for every one of those steps, we multiply grad log pi, a t given st, by another sum over t prime from one to capital T of r s t prime times a t prime. This is exactly the same equation, I just applied the distributive property of multiplication, uh, but this makes it a little bit more apparent why this estimator doesn't make use of causality, because the gradient of the uh, probability of an action at time t is multiplied by a sum that includes past rewards, but changing the probability of the action at time t is, not, is never going to change the rewards in the past. So what we can do is we can actually avoid summing in those rewards from the past and change that inner summation to be from t to capital T. So we basically take all the rewards from the current time step until the end, but don't include all the rewards in the past. It turns out this estimator is also correct, and it's actually better, because even though in expectation, the influence of those past rewards always integrates to zero, for a finite number of samples, we might get a little bit of sampling error, and those past rewards might actually influence our gradient, even though they shouldn't. And it's just sampling errors. It's basically noise due to the fact that we have a finite number of samples. So by zeroing those out, by basically using our knowledge that they must integrate to zero in expectation, we get an estimator with less noise. Formally, we say that this estimator has less variance, which just means that if you generate you know, many different groups of samples and estimate the gradient using those different groups, your estimates will be closer together if you drop those uh, past rewards than if you keep them. So this is a very simple modification of the policy gradient. It is always better. It never makes things worse. So you should definitely do this. And uh, this 
the interpretation of this sum as the reward to go, the total reward that you will get from now until the end, will actually be very important in the next lecture on Wednesday when we talk about value functions. So this general theme of taking the gradient of the log probability of an action and multiplying it by the total reward we'll get from now until the end of time will keep coming up again and again as we discuss reinforcement learning methods. We will call it q hat i comma t. So the reward to go for sample i times step t is the sum over t prime from little t to capital T of r s i t prime a i t prime, and we use the symbol q hat i t as shorthand to refer to this quantity. So we can also write it like this. Okay, so that was a simple trick that you can use with policy gradient. It always makes things better, and it's a really good idea, especially if your trajectories are very long. There's another trick that is very important that also always helps, uh, but it's a little bit less obvious, and it's called a baseline. So we had this intuition before that policy gradient essentially formalizes trial and error learning, that using the policy gradient will make good trajectories more likely and bad trajectories less likely. So we had this animation before. Good things are made more likely, bad things are made less likely. There was a little bit of a lie in this. I slightly misled you. That this is what we would like to happen, but it's not always guaranteed to happen for the estimator that I actually have on this slide. Imagine that all the rewards are large positive numbers. So maybe the best trajectory is 1 million and 10, the worst trajectory is 1 million and 1. Now the weights for all of the actions are actually big positive numbers, which means that we won't actually get this. We won't have the best trajectories getting better and the worst trajectories getting uh, less likely. What we'll actually get is all the trajectories becoming more likely. And that's not what we want. We don't just want to make all trajectories more likely if the rewards are positive. We want to make trajectories more likely if they are better than average. And we want to make them less likely if they are worse than average. So intuitively what we want to do is we want to take our rewards and subtract the average reward from them. Because if we change our gradient estimator to multiply the grad log pi by r minus the average of the r's, then we'll have exactly this. We'll, we'll have everything that's better than average becoming more likely and everything that's worse than average becoming less likely. But are we just allowed to do that? Like that seems like a completely arbitrary made up modification. We have this beautiful formula where we get grad log pi times r and now we've just arbitrarily changed it to be r minus b where b is the average reward. Is this allowed? Well, surprisingly enough, this estimator is still correct and it is much, much better. It is just as correct. There's actually nothing wrong with it. And it is better. And we can prove it. And the proof is that the expected value of that b will be zero. And this is, a, this is a common trick in statistics. If you have some sample based estimator and you can subtract off something that is zero in expectation, then when you subtract it off from the sample wise estimate, you get less variance, less variability between different groups of samples because you've subtracted something that you know is zero, but it might not be zero for a finite number of samples. So what we're going to prove is that subtracting b in expectation makes no difference. In order to prove this, we have to prove that the expected value of grad theta log pi theta tau times b is zero, right? Because the estimator I have at the top, you can distribute the grad log pi inside the, the difference, and you get grad log pi times r minus grad log pi times b. And if the expected value of grad log pi times b is zero, then you can subtract off any b without changing the expected value. So let's uh, try to prove that the expected value of grad log pi times b is in fact zero. So we're going to follow a similar recipe to the one that we used when we derived the policy gradient in the first place. We'll write this expected value as the integral over all trajectories of pi theta tau times grad log pi times b. That's just the definition of an expected value. And then we're going to apply our convenient identity that we had before, but we'll apply it in reverse. So before we use it to turn grad pi into pi, pi times grad log pi, and now we're going to go the other way and turn pi times grad log pi into grad pi. And now, remember that the gradient operator commutes with the integration operator because the gradient operator is a linear operator. 
So this is the same as b times grad theta of the integral of pi theta tau. Because we can take the b out of the integral, and we can take the gradient operator out of the integral. And now here's the trick. The integral over tau of pi theta tau is 1 because pi theta tau is a distribution. When you integrate a distribution over its entire domain, you get 1. That is one of the requirements for a probability distribution. So that means that you have b times the gradient with respect to theta of 1. And of course, 1 doesn't depend on theta, so that gradient is 0. And b times 0 is just 0. So we've just worked out a proof that shows that the expected value of grad log pi times b is 0, which means that you can subtract any b you want, and it will not change the expected value. It will, however, change the estimate that you get from a finite number of samples. And subtracting the average reward will reduce the variance of that estimator, which means that for the same number of samples, you will get a more accurate estimate of the policy gradient. So it is not only okay to subtract b, in fact, it will give you a more accurate policy gradient. Subtracting a baseline is unbiased in expectation, which means it does not change the expected value, but it will give you a more accurate estimate. I will note, this is kind of a side note, uh, the average reward is not the best baseline you can use. If you want to learn about the best baseline, I actually cover this in my graduate course, but it's a little bit of a mathematical oddity because in practice, usually we just use expected reward. But there's a lot of uh, deeper theory surrounding baselines in reinforcement learning, which you can learn about uh, in a, for example, a graduate reinforcement learning course. Okay, so just to summarize what I discussed so far, two ways that you can improve the policy gradient. One is use causality to sum rewards only from the current time step until the end, don't include the past rewards, and use a baseline to subtract the average reward. These two changes will make policy grading go from an algorithm that never works to an algorithm that sometimes works. So with baselines and that, that little causality trick, you can actually get a policy grading that can be used to solve real reinforcement learning problems. There are many other ways to improve it, but these two simple improvements give you enormous mileage. Basically, without them, it never works. All right. Now, um, some considerations for policy grading, and, and these, uh, these are some limitations that we'll address in future lectures. One thing to note about policy grading is that it is what's called an on-policy reinforcement learning algorithm. What that means is you must collect additional samples by actually running your policy in the real world every time you modify the policy parameters. Remember that your grading is, is an expected value under pi theta tau. And that, that, that spells trouble. That means that every time you need to compute the gradient, you need to sample from pi theta tau. So at every step of the reinforcement learning algorithm, you have to generate new samples and throw out your old samples. And that's actually kind of disappointing to us because back when we learned about mini-batch SGD, we learned how you could um, you know, basically keep sampling additional batches from the same data set. But now you can't do that anymore. You have to sample each batch by actually running the policy in the real world. So you always throw out all of your old data and collect new data. And you can't just skip that step, that sampling step. If you skip it, it will not work. So this is a problem because neural networks change only a little bit with each gradient step. And you usually need to take a huge number of gradient steps to train. So on policy learning can be extremely inefficient in terms of the number of samples because you need to interact with the world each time you take a gradient step. Now, there are ways to mitigate this. I won't go through these in great detail, but I do want to briefly describe them because uh, they form a very important foundation in practical policy gradient methods. And that's how you can use samples from other policies to estimate the policy gradient using important sampling. Okay, so what if you want to estimate the policy gradient, but you don't have samples from pi theta of tau? Instead, you have samples from some other policy like pi bar of tau. Maybe that's your old policy. What you can do is you can use important sampling. Important sampling is basically a way to estimate an expected value of some function under a distribution, given only samples from a different distribution. So let's say that I want to estimate the expected value of f of x under a distribution p of x. It's equal to the integral over p of x times f of x. And I can always substitute 1 
and one is equal to q of x over q of x. So basically taking some quantity and multiplying it by one doesn't change that quantity, so I can multiply p of x times f of x by one, and one is equal to q of x over, over q of x. And now I can slightly rearrange that fraction so that it's actually q of x times p of x over q of x. I, I just, it's the same exact equation, I just move the denominator over. And this now uh, is very clearly an expected value under q of x, right? Because whenever you see an integral of some distribution times something else, that's an expected value under that distribution. So this is just equal to an expected value under q of x of p of x over q of x times f of x. So what that means is that if you have samples from q of x and you would like to estimate an expectation under p of x, you just have to multiply your samples by p of x over q of x, which is called an importance weight. The reason it's called an importance weight is because samples that are more likely under p of x and less likely under q of x are deemed as being more important. And applying that correction gets you the expectation under the distribution you want. So we can apply this exact idea to estimate expectations under pi theta of tau using only samples from pi bar of tau. So if you want to write an important sampling estimator for the policy return, just put in the importance weights. It's exactly the equation on the right. I've just substituted in place of p, pi theta, in place of q, pi bar, and in place of f, r. So that's your importance weight. Now, the probabilities uh, in, these, in this importance weight are given by the equations we saw before, this big product over initial state probabilities, action probabilities, and transition probabilities. So if you were to write out the full ratio, you get a ratio of these two gigantic products. But the cool thing about these uh, uh, gigantic products is that most of the terms appear on both the top and bottom of the fraction, which means they cancel out. The initial state probabilities cancel out and the transition probabilities cancel out. And that's really important because, again, we don't know what the initial state probabilities are and we don't know what the transition probabilities are. So the fact that we can express our importance weights entirely in terms of the action probabilities, which are the only thing that we actually know, is very important because that means we can actually comp compute our importance weights. Okay. So our importance weights are just given as the ratio of the products of the action probabilities under the new policy divided by the product under the old policy. We can, of course, derive the policy gradient this way, too. Um, here is one way we can do it. We can say, can we estimate the value of some new parameters, theta prime? Okay, so this is the equation from the previous slide. If you have samples from pi theta, and now you want to estimate j of theta prime for some new parameters, theta prime, that's an expected value under pi theta of tau. That's the old policy now, so theta is, the, theta is not the thing we're optimizing. Theta is the old policy. It's the expected value under pi theta of tau of pi theta prime of tau divided by pi theta times r of tau. And this is now an objective that you can optimize as much as you want with respect to theta prime without generating new samples. So this is the only bit that depends on theta prime. If you want to calculate its gradient, uh, of course, the only bit that depends on theta prime is the numerator. And you can apply this, the convenient formula from before, the convenient identity, to, to take that grad theta prime pi theta prime in the numerator to be pi theta prime times grad log pi theta prime. And then if you put the pi theta prime in the numerator and take the grad log pi out of the numerator, then you get this equation. And this is very convenient. This is just this, the policy gradient we had before, only now every sample is weighted by pi theta prime over pi theta, and the expectation is taken under the old policy pi theta. And uh, furthermore, if theta is equal to theta prime, so if you're just estimating the gradient locally, uh, if you, if, uh, you know, having just sampled from theta, then the importance weight cancels out. So then you, you recover the regular on policy gradient, uh, which is very convenient. Okay, but if we don't want to just recover the on policy gradient and we actually want an off policy algorithm, if we want to take multiple gradient steps without generating new samples, um, then you have this importance weight. And the importance weight, is, it, it, as you recall from before, is just the ratio of the products of the action probabilities. Now, unfortunately, this is a very bad estimator. Uh, so here I, I, I've written out all the products and sums and so on for you to see. Uh, you can apply causality just like before. Um, so you can apply that 
by distributing the product over uh, the importance weights inside the sum uh, over log pi. And you, you, you can split that product in basically two halves. Right? You have the product over all the time steps up until t and the product of all the time steps after t. It, it's the same exact equation. Uh, but what this makes apparent is that this, uh, for every time step, basically one piece of that product accounts for getting to that time step and the other piece accounts for what happens afterwards. Um, so future actions don't affect the current weight. Um, and uh, you can actually delete the importance weight on the future rewards. This is not equal, this is not an equality anymore if you delete it, but it turns out to still be uh, a valid gradient. The reason for that is a little bit technical. We, we don't have time to get through it, to go through it in this class. But that's very desirable to do because getting rid of those additional importance weights uh, re results in not having to multiply so many numbers together. So that's a very nice thing to do. Unfortunately, you can't get rid of the importance weight uh, from time step one until t. And this is actually a big problem because you're multiplying together on the order of t probabilities, which means those, those importance weights quickly go to zero or infinity. So basically, um, every one of those, both the numerator and the denominator, each of those products goes either to zero or, uh, uh, well, they, they each go to zero actually exponentially fast. So when you take the ratio of them, you basically get zero or infinity if t is large enough. Uh, another way of saying this is that the importance weights become degenerate exponentially fast. And that's actually a big problem. Um, so here is uh, what we can do to alleviate that. We can write the um, objective a little bit differently. We can take our regular on-policy gradient, and instead of writing it as an expectation over trajectories, we can write it as an um, expectation over state action marginals. So basically, you can sample states and actions at every time step, as long as they're sampled from the margin of the trajectory distribution, that's a correct estimator. And then you can actually compute an importance weight over those marginals. So pi theta prime SA divided by pi theta SA. And of course, that, that you can factorize into a state-dependent term and an action-dependent term. So pi theta S times pi theta A given S. And it's that S term that's really the problem. You have access to a given s, you don't have access to pi of s. So what you can do is you can somewhat heuristically just ignore that point. Just literally just delete that, say that that part of the weight is equal to 1. That is no longer correct. It is no longer unbiased. But if theta and theta prime are very close together, it turns out that the error from doing this can be bounded. Basically, if your new policy pi theta prime is close to pi theta, you can ignore this part of the weight, and your policy gradient will only be a little bit wrong. And that actually now leads to a practical algorithm that we can actually use. So we generate some samples, and then we weight those samples by the importance weight for only that, that a single time step. But we don't optimize too far. If we go too far, then our gradients will become incorrect. So that's kind of a practical way to use important sampling in a policy gradient in reality. Now, this part is a little bit advanced. Uh, we're not going to test you for um, important sample policy gradient on the, on the exam, so you should make sure that you uh, understand the regular policy gradient, um, and then just have some idea at a, a kind of a casual level that you can use important sampling to make it off policy, but we're not going to test you on the math for that. But just keep in mind that in practice, this simplification is very commonly used, and uh, it's often a crucial ingredient for practical, uh, important sample policy gradient methods. Okay, uh, now for something more practical, and this is something that you will actually uh, likely use. Um, how do we actually calculate policy gradients with automatic differentiation? So I mentioned before the policy gradient looks a lot like the maximum likelihood gradient with the addition of those rewards uh, as a multiplicative term. So you don't want to just compute the grad log pi separately and then multiply them by the rewards. You want to use backpropagation. Um, so in order to use backpropagation, you basically have to set up a computational graph whose gradients are the policy gradients. And the way that we're going to do that is by noting the similarity of the maximum likelihood gradient. 
So for maximum likelihood, we form an objective, which is the average log probability, and then we run back propagation, and we get the gradient of the average log probability. So for policy gradient, we're going to implement a kind of pseudo loss. We're going to implement a pseudo loss, which is the average log probability of the actions, multiplied by q hat, where our back propagation algorithm is going to assume that q hat doesn't depend on theta. Now, in reality, q hat does depend on theta, but that dependence goes through the environment dynamics, so that's not part of our computation graph. But if we set up this kind of pseudo loss, uh, where you know log pi can be implemented with either cross entropy or squared error if you have continuous actions and you want Gaussians, then back propagation will automatically calculate the policy gradient for you. Uh, so here it is in kind of TensorFlow style pseudocode. And it's, it's a very similar concept in PyTorch as well. The pseudocode I have here is TensorFlow style, but hopefully it's pretty clear. It's only a few lines of code. So we're going to assume that we have two tensors, an action tensor, whose dimensionality is the number of samples times the number of time steps by the dimensionality of the action. And we're going to have a state tensor for which we're going to assume its dimensionality is the number of samples times the number of time steps by the state dimensionality. Logits is going to be the result of running a forward pass in your neural network. So logits is basically the log probabilities predicted by your network. And then if we were to implement maximum likelihood, we would have negative likelihood be given by the cross entropy loss applied to the logits where the ground truth labels are the actions that were actually taken. So this is, the, this is what you would do if you wanted maximum likelihood. And then you would average uh, over all the samples, that's the reduced mean operation, and then take the gradient of that using back propagation. If you want to turn this into a policy gradient, all you have to do is you have to weight those negative likelihoods by the Q hat values. So you have an additional tensor called Q values whose dimensionality is the number of samples times the number of time steps by one, and you just pointwise multiply it along the first axis uh, by the negative likelihoods. And that weights all those negative likelihoods by Q hat, and then the rest is exactly the same. So that third line, the weighted negative likelihoods equals uh, multiplying negative likelihoods by Q values, that's the only modification you have to make uh, to the standard maximum likelihood code to get it to compute the policy gradient for you. So essentially that third line, the one in red, implements this pseudo loss and the gradient of that pseudo loss if you assume that Q hat doesn't depend on theta, which your, which your automatic differentiation software will assume, even though it's not true, um, that will get you the policy gradient. So it's actually very, very simple to implement naively. Although a lot of the work in implementing policy grading goes into things like computing those Q values with baselines and stuff like that correctly so that you get the right result. Okay, uh, a few comments about policy gradients in practice. Remember that the policy gradient has high variance, uh, which means that if you um, want to estimate the policy gradient using samples, you would typically need more samples than you would use in a normal supervised learning uh, mini batch. So it's not the same as supervised learning. Even though it looks a lot like supervised learning, you need many more samples. Your gradients will basically be really noisy. Now, consider using much larger batches. Tweaking learning rates becomes harder for the same reason. And adaptive step size rules like Adam become much more important for policy gradient. Um, what are policy gradients actually used for? Well, you can obviously use policy gradients to learn policies with reinforcement learning for control, but policy gradients can also be used in a range of settings where you need to compute derivatives through non-differentiable operations. For example, uh, this paper called Recurrent Models of Visual Attention uh, uses uh, a, a little glimpse window to figure out which part of the image to look at to maximize accuracy. And cropping out that glimpse is a non-differentiable operation, so they actually use policy gradient for that, even though they're not solving a control problem directly. So there are many places in deep learning where we use policy gradient or reinforce, not because we want to do control, but because we want to differentiate through an ordinarily non-differentiable operation. Um, you can also use reinforce or policy gradient in discrete latent variable models. So these are models that have random variables in them, which are discrete rather than continuous, and you need to differentiate through them. Uh, obviously, you can't compute the derivative with respect to a discrete variable, but you can uh, make that variable stochastic and then compute the derivative with respect to the parameters of its distribution using policy gradients. Uh, 
So if this seems a little bit advanced, don't worry about that for now. We'll talk about these latent variable models a lot more after spring break. Long story short, policy gradient, or reinforce, can be used in any setting where we have to differentiate through a stochastic but non-differentiable operation. Okay, so just to recap, uh, we talked about how policy gradient is on policy. We talked about how we can evaluate the RL objective by generating samples. We talked about how we can evaluate the policy gradient using the log gradient trick uh, and using samples. We talked about how we can derive an off-policy variant of policy gradient using important sampling, but that unfortunately has exponential scaling in T. If we ignore the state portion, which is an approximation, then we actually get a tractable uh, important sample algorithm. We talked about how to implement policy gradient using automatic differentiation. You just have to set it up so that you know what to backpropagate. And we talked about some practical considerations. So here's the basic reinforced uh, algorithm once again. Just This is kind of the main thing to take away from this lecture. But also remember that all these tricks, baselines, etc., these are all really important to make this work. Here's an example of policy gradients in action. This is from the Trust Region Policy Optimization paper. So here policy gradients are being used to learn a wide range of different behaviors, running, swimming, walking, etc. This uses a more advanced version uh, based on something called natural gradient. Um, uh, which we won't cover in this class, but it would be covered in a graduate level reinforced learning course. If you do want to learn more about policy gradient, this is, again, not something that's going to be on the test, but if you're excited about it and you want to learn more, uh, here are a few classic papers. This is the paper that actually introduced policy gradient, and this is the paper that introduced that causality trick. And this paper is kind of a good general survey, also explains baselines and optimal baselines. For more modern papers that actually combine deep learning with policy gradients, uh, guided policy search that uses a, a classic important sample estimator, trust region policy optimization, proximal policy optimization. Um, those are kind of the, the papers that implement deep neural nets um, with policy gradients.